It's my great pleasure and honor to introduce today's speaker, Lara Elizabeth Putnam, a professor of history at the University of Pittsburgh to the audience today uh, on the name of the Bonn Center for Slavery and Dependency Studies. Um, Professor uh, Putnam has gained her or has received her PhD uh, from the University of Michigan in Arbor in 2000 and has studied in Harvard University. Um, among her research interests that are of relevance, of course, to uh, also to the BCDSS, I wish to name two. One is on information ecosystems, <laughs> which I find very interesting because it pertains to the whole discussion of the colonial archives, uh, creating data and absence of data from the quantitative to the digital age. Um, the second uh, interest that I would like to uh, point out to you is what she calls Travels and Terrains, Transnational Approaches to the History of Race and Anti-Racism in the Post-Emancipation Atlantic World. Uh, I expect you to talk about this a little more today, probably, um, too. What I found particularly interesting uh, is your interest in methodological questions, uh, for example, the whole microhistory Atlantic. <laughs> um, situation or relationship context um and also that and i mentioned that before that you have became an active uh, commentator on current politics in the united states uh which is not only much needed i think that historians take part in these discussions um but obviously it makes a lot of sense to um leading journals such as the washington post and so on um to invite you as an expert however your range of academic publications is really huge. Um, I wish to mention your book, uh, Radical Moves, uh, Caribbean Migrants and the Politics of Race and the Jazz Age, which has been published with the University of North Carolina Press. And also one article that also received an award, uh, the Andres Ramos Matei Neville Hall Article Prize <laughs> um, for your article, um, on citizenship uh, from the margins, vernacular theories of rights and the state from the interwar Caribbean and the Journal of British Studies. And as an early modernist, the history from the margins and Natalie Simon Davis. So of course, something um, that I like very much. And also I think your uh, presentation today, uh, which is going to be on uh, child labor and sexual abuse in a mobile world, vexed asymmetric dependencies, and the post-emancipation Greater Caribbean focuses on so-called subaltern actors and agencies. So uh, again, it's really a pleasure and an honor to have you here today as a speaker uh, on the Joseph C. Miller uh, Memorial Lecture Series. And the floor is yours. So thank you so much. And thank you, Claudia, for that very kind introduction. And thank you all for the invitation to be here uh, and to speak with you uh, for the next 45 minutes or so. I'm going to try to uh, speak briefly and leave a lot of time for discussion, which is the part of our interaction that I'll find uh, most valuable. And I know I'll learn a lot from the different perspectives that people bring uh, to, to these topics. The Topic that I propose to speak about today, child labor and sexual abuse in uh, the post-emancipation Caribbean is a difficult topic to speak about. Um, and it's a difficult topic to write about. And I ha have, um, I'm gonna talk to you on the basis of some sources that I first located in the archives in Costa Rica, especially when I was doing my doctoral dissertation research a quarter century ago. So in the time since then, I have had, I have uh, given birth to and raised four children myself. I've had a whole career and I have not really, I've used those, the sources that I'm gonna describe to you uh, as input for describing some aspects of the lives that are shown there, but I have not written about what is actually at front and center in the sources, which is accusations of sexual abuse. And um, over the last five to 10 years, I've sort of returned to struggle with the question of why it is that it is so, why have I in practice made the decision to write from sources that are generated by accusations of sexual abuse, but not to write about sexual abuse? 
So in, in some, and, and I don't have good answer. I think there are methodological questions that are raised by these sources. I think there are theoretical questions that are raised by these sources. There are ethical questions raised by these sources. There are narrative questions raised by these sources. Um, and I don't have answers to any of those questions. So rather than pretending that I have answers that I'm comfortable with, I'm going to lay out for you what why I think of these as being vexed, uh, both vexed asymmetric dependencies and also vexed sources for understanding asymmetric dependencies. Um, and, and then hopefully we can talk about our talk together about different ways in which one might try to balance um, the, the different um, obligations that we have as scholars in this, in this, in this, when looking at these sources. So first, let me tell you something about the, just the basic setting that I'm describing for you. Um, the sources come from the national, the bulk of the sources come from the National Archive of Costa Rica. Um, and their judicial sources from the start of the, the, from the late 19th and start of the 20th century. So they go from the 1890s to 1910s, roughly. Uh, there are about 50 documents that, I, um, judicial cases that I found in those archives that were categorized as either um, violación, which means rape, or estupro, which means um, deceptive deflowering. And I'll, I'll return sh shortly to the exact definition, what, where the, difference is between these two definitions of rape and deceptive deflowering. Um, the, the cases come from the province of Limón in Costa Rica. And the province of Limón was the, uh, is on the Caribbean coast of Costa Rica. It's where um, there a railroad was built from this port, Port Limón up to the center of uh, the central highlands of Costa Rica in the late 19th century. Um, and as part of that railroad building project, um, uh, workers were contracted in the British Caribbean. And so the movement of workers, especially from Jamaica to uh, the Co Costa Rica as part of this railroad building project. And then what became subsequently uh, a banana plantation project that ended up in, with the creation in the zone of what became the United Fruit Company um, and the a sort of center of banana exports and as part of uh, what becomes a huge um, economic empire of the United Fruit Company. That, that little economic story of labor migration um, it, from largely Jamaica and, and other islands of the Caribbean to the coast of Central America is part of a much bigger story, both within the Caribbean and actually more broadly across the Atlantic world of post-emancipation labor migrations. Um, and so in the generations after the end of uh, legal slavery in the British Caribbean, I, as probably everyone on this on this lecture on this call knows, um, people people moved to find people who were who had themselves been enslaved, uh, and people whose parents had been enslaved, moved to in as part of a struggle to uh, make their way with what autonomy they could create and what opportunities for up upward mobility they could create. People moved away from plantations within islands like. Jamaica, uh, Barbados, and Trinidad, people moved away from the plantations to uh, seek areas where they could do their own account farming uh, and maybe supplement their labor uh, on their on their own freeholds, often very small freeholds, with some wage labor. But people also moved into new destinations where they could earn better wages than were being offered by the planters and the descendants of planters on their islands of origin. Um, and this especially became true in the British Caribbean as the subsidized systems of um, labor migration from South Asia, uh, which were organized by the uh, British Empire in the wake of the end of slavery uh, for the territories, for British colonial territories within the Americas, that kept wages depressed. So people moved to seek opportunity elsewhere. And that happened both within islands and off islands. And as people the those migration flows tended to especially those going to off island destinations tended to be initially men migrating the first um in the first sort of five to ten years migratory flows were heavily male uh, but very rapidly their women would follow um not usually following men who were members of their own family but rather traveling as their own 
um, independent entrepreneurs. And this was because male, mig heavily male post-emancipation migration flows created at port cities in particular, um, sort of booming economic opportunities for the kinds of services that women uh, would offer. And of course, in the post-emancipation Greater Caribbean, and when I say Greater Caribbean, I'm really referring not just to the islands, but to the rimlands as well. So we're talking about Venezuela, Colombia, Panama, Costa Rica, um, as well as Cuba, and eventually the Greater Caribbean sort of comes to encompass uh, New York uh, and Harlem, most of all, which becomes a major emigration destination as well for British Caribbeans uh, by the 1920s, 1910s, 1920s. But those, those migratory flows going to port cities in particular come to encompass very significant numbers of women and children within five to 10 years of their the initiation of each migratory flow to each new destination, because there's a real um, demand in in port cities in particular for the kind of services that women offer for the kind and those often the work that women uh entrepreneurs did uh in in those settings was the work of sort of daily social reproduction sort of selling fresh food a place to take a shower a place to sleep um clean clothes and uh sometimes sexual services as well so the kinds of um the kinds of reproductive labor in the sense of daily social reproduction that in most societies of origin was provided not for cash or for some combination of cash and other kinds of non-cash resources and uh, within kinship structures in destinations. And these port destinations were often provided for cash. And that meant that it was a sort of, uh, it was a seller's economy. If you were doing laundry, um, selling sweets, uh, establishing a boarding house, or, or or selling sex. So these, um, and this is true at basically all of the different ports that became uh, important migratory destinations. And so this is a story, the story I've just told you is one that I have, you know, I told in the first, in my doctoral dissertation a half century ago, and then have repeated since then. And, and one of the points, that, and I've focused a lot on women's labor and women's social networks and kin networks and the role, for instance, of um, girls and young women who might have traveled from uh, islands of origin from their, um, uh, the, you know, from Jamaica, Barbados, uh, the island on which they were born, to join an aunt or a, um, a female guardian at a port uh, like Port Limon in Costa Rica, or like Panama City, or like Bocas del Toro, um, or Havana, or Santiago de Cuba, in and these uh, you know girls in found themselves incorporated into uh, these port economies, these sort of female-run port economies, running errands for an older you know either their mother or their aunt, their grandmother, an older female guardian who might be working as a midwife. Uh, as a boarding house owner and so on. And the, the sources that enabled me to talk about what I've described to you as the sort of empowered space of women running economies, women, women headed households and women led social networks. But the sources that allow me to speak to that kind, the kinds of daily work that went into this are disproportionately sources that I found under these cat heading categories of estupro or violación. So deceptive deflowering or rape. And the reason, and, and so there's this, this is sort of the core methodological, theoretical, ethical dilemma that I bring before you, which is that I recognize that I have told a story, which I believe is true, of uh, sort of, which ends up being a story about female power or independence. And I have not talked about the, the aspects of the, sort of what's what's actually at the center, the trigger for the sources that most uh, um, consistently put girls at the center, which are these accusations of uh, of rape or deceptive deflowering. So why is it that those cases are so hard to work with? So you can, I, I, I sort of have treated them as a reliable window onto daily life because the sort of the mention, the side mentions in the testimony in these sources gives this invaluable window onto how lives are working in these in these settings and into the roles of people who are usually ignored by, you know, official accounts, they're ignored by um, 
uh, even you know, travelers tend not to talk about this sort of women's labor and the, the the way that the streets of these ports are full of like girls scurrying to run errands uh, and doing work. But but what's at the core of each of these the sources that most reliably tells girls' stories um, is an accusation of of a horrible crime, the details of which are usually blurry uh, or sometimes blurry. And so here are the here's here are some of the ways in which I find these really difficult sources to work with. First of all, it's just these are horrible stories to tell, right? The age of the girls involved ranges from several years to early teens. And here I'll take a step aside and tell you something about the legal definition of estupro, uh, which is deceptive to flowering and violación. So in theory, uh, violación refer the uh, sexual intercourse or efforts at penetration of any kind um, uh, with uh, a girl 12 years or younger was supposed by Costa Rican law in the start of the 20th century was by definition rape. So there was no a, any kind of uh, sexual penetration carried out by a man against a girl who was under 12 in theory was automatically raped. There was no question of consent or not consent. There was no notion that a girl under the age of 12 could consent in any meaningful way. Um, and in again, in theory, any um, uh, sexual contact, any efforts at sexual penetration of a girl 12 and older uh, or a woman of any age, if it was by means of force, was also rape. There was no question in legal doctrine about this. In practice, as we'll see, there was no enforcement of that for adult women, essentially. Um, deceptive deflowering was the uh, uh, the sort of loss was defined as loss of virginity through false promises, uh, whether false promises of uh, future betrothal um, or uh, the use of um, uh, of emotional coercion or uh, promises of money for a girl aged 13 to 20. And so the, so in, in theory, if there were, if force was being used, this was not false promises, this was rape. Uh, and in theory, if the, the child in question was under 12, it was automatically rape. Now in practice, um, it's clear, it's, and in practice, these definitions, you'll as you've seen, did not depend at all on any kind of uh, notion of like the virtue of the girl in question, the um, the history of the of the girl in question, or the child in question, or her family. Um, in in practice, there was a cut and dry distinction here, and and the only question was what had been the actions of the man involved. So the the first so what are the dilemmas that these cases present? First first and foremost, there are ma many of them are just horribly sad stories in which you're hearing we're hearing about young girls, um, uh, so, uh, the about two thirds of the cases involve uh, girls under under 12 and many involve girls under 10. Uh, eight, and stories that are like uh, vivid and plausible and very sad stories of children being violated. Um, and even in drafts of this paper that I have presented, I've had very different reactions from people reading the draft as to whether I should discuss any of the details of the cases at all. Some people have argued that it's important to present some details of the cases to destigmatize these experiences, um, to treat this kind of violence as the violence it is, recognize it, recognize that it was a part of what women faced um, and girls faced uh, in, in, in these settings. Um, other other readers have felt that to to present any of the details of any of the individual cases essentially re-victimizes the children involved um, without any you know and even you know obviously anonymizing of them does not uh, in the view of some readers take away the sense of violation um, of their privacy by retelling these stories and and furthermore the fact that so many especially in the early years of the 20th century, during which the population of Port Limon was in its great majority, immigrants from the British Caribbean, so you've got, these are black women and girls, Afro-descended women and girls, um, uh, whose testimonies are being presented before uh, Costa Rican legal authorities. Um, so there's a, the, the dimension of 
race is necessarily there. And so the question of um, whether we are sort of, whether even by telling the details of the story, I'm essentially fetishizing Black women's suffering and Black women's, the sort of the sexual sexualization of Black women in ways that make it inappropriate for, for me to be describing the content of any of these cases. And I, I think that critique is really valid. And I also think the argument which says we need to be willing to describe and pay witness to and um, destigmatize uh, these, these stories, uh, these experiences is also valid. So in the current draft of the written version of this paper, I include five uh, summaries of different cases just so that people can see what they look like. And I say beforehand, the next five the next five paragraphs contain summaries of cases. You should make your own choice. Here are the arguments in favor of you reading them. Here are the arguments against you reading them. Make your own choice whether to skip over them or to read them. I, I don't think that's a perfect solution either. So that's, an, that's one of the things that I would love your feedback on. So what are the dilemmas? One of the dilemmas is that the, the categories that exist in co the Costa Rican legal system are not being uh, applied consistently. And so any kind of statistical analysis of like, what are the patterns of uh, the victimization of girls? You know, can we use these sources to understand not just what was being charged, but what was happening is a really vexed question. Right. It's it's the and there's a there's an interesting uh, pattern of differentiation by uh, by ethnicity or origin in which. So I've, I've, as I've described to you, um, uh, any kind of sexual assault on a or any kind of sexual contact period, whatever, whatever the circumstances with a girl under 12 um, should be should have been. Uh, automatically defined as rape um, and and in contrast to deceptive deflowering, which is supposed to be a, which is for, for which only, essentially only teenage girls are, um, can be the alleged victims. Um, so they're supposed, to, supposedly there's both sort of difference in circumstance and difference in ages. In practice, if we look at the cases that uh, th these you know, five dozen, four dozen cases that uh, have been preserved for Limon. Um, it's much more common for British Caribbean immigrant girls to appear in violacion cases and, and to be younger. And it's much more common for um, Spanish speaking girls in the port to appear in estupro cases in these deceptive deflowering cases. Now, is that because British Caribbean girls were physically attacked more often? Uh, or is it because British Caribbean girls' parents were more willing to demand state action against rapists who had assaulted their child, w were perhaps less concerned about uh, ways in which simply public recognition of a sexual assault would might dishonor the family, and therefore were British Caribbean parents or female guardians, which was in, in the great majority of cases, um, these girls were living with, with either mothers, aunts, or female guardians in the port, were those women more likely to denounce uh, sexual attacks, whereas uh, Spanish-speaking Costa Rican uh, mothers in the port might have been less likely to denounce um, assaults on their on girls, on underage girls? Like both of those are very plausible possibilities. That it is impossible for us to know um, what's the rate of, you know, what's the difference in underlying pattern and what's the difference in. Um, the parents' usage of the court system. It, at a minimum, it certainly seems to be the case. If you look, if you look at the um, uh, testimonies, that part of the issue. So that for estupro, for violación, uh, rape cases, these are criminal assaults, and the punishments are uh, criminal punishments. So if a man is found guilty, which only happened even even given. What, what I should say is that there, there are essentially no cases of violacion accusations with adult women um, in Limon of any ethnicity in this time. Do, do I think that's because there was no rape being done in this time? But absolutely not. Um, I think in practice, the it, it's only it was only with adolescent or pre-adolescent girls that the courts were willing to say, 
you know, by definition, uh, a crime was committed by the man in this case. For estupro cases, the these deceptive deflowering cases, the remedy was marriage. So the idea is because the logic of the estupro law is that this is a woman who's been tricked into losing her virginity to uh, without actual marriage, and the remedy is they should get married. So it it I I think it is it's plausible uh, both from surrounding. Uh, everything we know about British Caribbean kinship patterns and and from the um, textual evidence in these cases to say that British Car the British Caribbean mothers and guardians were much less interested in pushing their daughters into marriage uh, when they had with someone who had sexually assaulted them or had convinced them to have sex with him. Um, so this this the the remedy on offer from estupro cases was pretty clearly not a remedy that British Caribbean families were seeking out. Um, that, but that's that's that still doesn't address questions of, you know, can we speak to relative uh, frequency of sexual victimization? I don't think we can because these questions of, you know, to what extent, how likely are different people to bring cases at different times um, or are people from different groups? It's, there's so many, there's so many unknowns around the, uh, um, the rate of use of the care of the um, uh, judicial system to try to seek redress. The other thing, of course, is that the other, another thing that makes these categories, of course, is really difficult to work with is that the Costa Rican judicial system is, of course, rife with um, uh, racialized assumptions about women and their virtue and what uh, women of different and girls of different categories uh, might have done or would likely have done. And this is, this sort of pervades these sources in ways that make it, um, that make it feel almost inappropriate to take them seriously as windows onto the past because they're so clearly first and foremost windows onto the racialized presumptions of the officials in question. And so you have debates between um, the judges in the cases and it, in cases where the cases move forward beyond the initial accusation, um, they're often defense witness, defense lawyers uh, who um, make accusations of all kinds against the girls in question, even though, again, in theory, um, questions of the girls' conduct, girls' prior experiences, in theory, are completely irrelevant to the, to the legal categories in question and the legal judgments in question. But in practice, you have, um, for instance, defense lawyers saying, asking leading questions of witnesses like, wouldn't you say it's the case that Jamaicans take little care of their children? So isn't it the case that this girl was well known for traveling, for going freely in the markets? And so these kinds of questions, and it, isn't it the case, and, and, and in some cases, even the, um, the medical descriptions of the girls in question will uh, make reference to their supposed sexual maturity, even though, you know, she, oh, she, she's 11 years old, or she's 12 years old, but she shows the curves of a woman, well, that should be completely irrelevant to any of the uh, any of the legal matters in, in question. Um, but this is the kind of language that pervades these sources. And so we can certainly, you know, one can talk about these sources as a window onto the racism of the past, that would be entirely appropriate. But also then that becomes, to my mind, a sort of, I mean, we we don't need yet another set of sources to establish the virulent anti-black female, like racism against black women in the turn of the century Caribbean. We know that to be a fact. It certainly is important to mention it again, but, um, but how do, how do we need to um, foreground that aspect? If foregrounding the racism of the officials in question and just sticking there, does that itself, does that narrative choice itself, again, sort of erase the experiences and erase the unique um, specificity of violence done to these girls in these contexts? The, the other aspect of that racism, of course, is that there was um, the Costa Rican judicial system is also, we know to have been um, consistently racist against, a, you know, May, black men as well. And so there would be every reason to assume that 
a black man accused of uh, conducting a uh, carrying out a sexual assault would not be uh, uh, given a sort of fair and impartial hearing in these courts. Now, one thing which is striking is that there there are no cases in these court records in which uh, immigrant black men are accused of sexual assault against non-black women. Um, so this isn't the case of a, uh, you know, the uh, like was something that we would see in the U.S. judicial system at the time of uh, sort of moral panic um, uh, or, or um, the kinds of accusations of black male violence against white women that within the United States were so consistently a part of lynching, you know, supposed justifications for lynching and patterns of black dis political disenfranchisement. So this um, uh, the sort of false myth of the in, in the U.S. context of the black male rapist is actually not present in these judicial sources for Costa Rica, at least. Um, and in fact, more often there's there are in the set of uh, four dozen cases, there are several cases in which it's Costa Rican men um, understood in the context, in local context as being white, uh, who are accused of uh, of assaulting black girls. Um, but that doesn't but that the that sort of fact of um uh those demographic patterns doesn't erase the fact that we know that we're not only are we seeing uh we're working with judicial course cases in which racialized notions um shaped perceptions of the victims in question but that we are also working with a judicial system in which um racist and racialized notions shape perceptions of the men in question um, and this is true not only with regard to um, the uh, Black immigrant girls in question, but also with regard to, in, there were also Indigenous communities still um, very much uh, present and active in the southern part of Limon province. And there are several court cases in which um, uh, there were accusations of sexual assault against Indigenous girls. And again, uh, of of all of these cases, we only have um, six cases in which uh, the men were found guilty of the assault, uh, and even so, that is the I don't know what 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 number are we on. This is like the third reason that these cases are really difficult to deal with because, on the one hand, um, there's every reason to th they they generate. Um, a clear sense that we're only seeing part of the problem. I I would never claim on the basis of these sources that were that the that there was um that the majority uh of cases of sexual violence against women, children, and girls in Limon were generated um uh court cases. So clearly there's a much broader pattern of victimization. And this is where I mentioned this um, in particular with regard to the indigenous girls, because there are other, other some other cases, including um, uh, travelers narratives and um, uh, some a, a few newspaper sources make me think, I think lead one to believe that sexual violence against indigenous women and girls was extremely common by outsiders and possibly also by members of their own communities was actually extremely common in these years. But even in, as I'm saying this, you can hear, I you do how common was sexual victimization, for instance, of indigenous women in Limon by members of their own communities? Well, I've, I've read multiple accusations that say that it was common. Those are often accusations brought by uh, outsider men who are being accused of themselves having committed sexual assaults in the community saying, oh, but everyone does it. So do we trust them when they say, oh, I'm just doing this thing that other, that men of this community already are doing to women in this community? They're not reliable narrators. And on the other hand, from other testimony within the other voices within the testimony, lead one to think that in fact, sexual victimization for women in these communities was, was in fact quite common, but these are fragile traces of evidence. You know, the word choices that make you, that uh, make one as um, as reader um, uh, 
into it that the experience of sexual victimization was not at all uncommon in these communities, again, both from insiders and from outside insider men and outsider men. And then you say, well, we're, what are, if I'm, if we are, you know, reduced to listening to tones of uh, testimony to see whether women seem to be suggesting that these experiences are common or uncommon, expected or unexpected. Um, this is again, a, an enormously fraught and fragile source of evidence because we're listening to these women through, testifying through translators. And then that testimony, which is given through a translator is being written down by a third party. So these are the voices are um, going through multiple intermediaries, each of whom would have had their own, again, set of presumptions shaped by uh, hierarchies of race, racism, uh, citizenship, and more. So the these, I, I, the, I think this gives you some sense of both why I think it's really important for us to capture the, um, and I'll give you, actually, I'll give you a final, a final example of, or a final uh, point on why it's um, difficult to, to me, these, these sources are sort of particularly slippery to work with and, and especially difficult to uh, draw conclusions about the prevalence um, or patterns of sexual assault from. Um, in multiple cases, actually, including one of the longest cases brought with regard to an indigenous girl, and in other cases, the, the men in question argue that the reason that they're facing accusations of uh, sexual assault has nothing to do with sex at all. So in one case, a man says, I did not touch that girl. I'm in my 60s. I'm too old for such things anyway. And the only reason I'm being accused of having touched that girl is that her aunt and I are in a dispute over ownership of these cocoa land, cocoa, uh, coconut trees. And from the totality of uh, testimony in that case, it does indeed seem that this the man in question was in a dispute with the aunt over coconut trees. Now, does that mean that he didn't commit the sexual assault in question? Not necessarily. But what what why was it that that particular court, why did that particular man end up getting denounced to public authorities? Was it because of the, because he would, of this other conflict that had nothing to do with sexual assault? Very plausibly. Sort of similarly in one of the cases in which there's a, uh, an outside, actually it's a Costa Rican justice of the peace, ends up accused in court of having sexually assaulted an, an indigenous girl in Talamanca, in the south of Limon. Um, he argues that the only reason that he's being denounced for this is because of his political conflicts with one faction of, um, there are sort of multiple factions of outsiders uh, seeking to expand plantations in the region. He is trying to, he says he's trying to defend one area. And as a result, he's ended up being denounced before for this sexual assault. And again, the basic patterns of political conflict that he's describing indeed were underway. We know about them from other sources, but does that mean that he did not commit the sexual assault in question? It doesn't mean that he didn't do it, right? So, and you can, you know, if if you sort of take a step back, it makes sense in a world in which um, women were girls and teenage girls and, and, um, and girls younger than that uh, were routinely vulnerable to sexual attacks uh, and sexual violence, it makes sense. It it wouldn't. It should not surprise us that sometimes those were only that ongoing pattern of vulnerability and violence only generated, only sort of reached the attention of the courts when the man in question was either disempowered for some reason or was facing some other kind of conflict. So, so it's not either or. It's not oh, was this just you know was the accusation. Uh, made up because of this other conflict. Well, the accusation may well be true, but it can also be true that we only hear about those accusations or they only move forward when there are other kinds of power dynamics at work. Um, and, and that uh, to me adds another layer that makes it all the more difficult to speak about what patterns there may be in the underlying um, experiences because the social dynamics and the um, the historical dynamics that end up creating 
register written registry of these experiences are so complex, have so many different levels to them um, in ways that are themselves sort of shaped by these uh, um, intense uh, power conflict, hi power hierarchies and power conflicts of the of the era in question. So with all of that, I think the the what we at a minimum, what we can say um, with regard to to this to this era to and to girls' experiences of the post-emancipation um, Greater Caribbean is that sexual vulnerability was a continuous part of girls' awareness of their own lives. And what and and maybe the one thing that I really can say on the basis of the the of the the witness depositions, the commentaries from neighbors who are brought in as 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 witnesses, the comments from girls themselves, the comments uh, from mothers and aunts that are captured in these uh, court testimonies, is that um, on the one hand, for uh, when the victims are age nine or ten or younger, there is um, like uh, a real rejection of. Everyone involved agrees that that what happened was awful, horrible, and wrong. Um, no one, no one involved. When we're especially when we're talking about a girl, good God, younger than nine, no one involved tries to justify it. Men involved say it didn't happen, but they don't try to justify it. Um, but once we're talking about girls in their young teens, or even in age, girls age like 11, 12, um, no one seems surprised that such a thing could happen. So if nothing else from the from the qualitative understanding of the and qualitative reading of the source, sources in question, um, kind of regardless of whatever complicated political process may have generated a denunciation in one case or not, clearly the social pattern that we can speak to is that uh, girls aged 11 or 12 or 13 in these communities were, knew themselves to be and were known to be sexually vulnerable and vulnerable to sexual coercion and sexual violence. Um, and in those cases, it's more often, and, and certainly the case for when um, for, for teenage girls, um, it's much more common for the men in question to absolutely minimize any wrongdoing on their part while not denying uh, that sexual contact as they would describe it rather than a sexual assault took place. And so, I end I reaffirmed in my sense that we, if if this aspect, if sexual vulnerability and vulnerability to sexual violence was it's like known to be routinely part of the experiences of preteen girls and teenage girls in these communities, then we should find a place for talking about that explicitly in our discussion of the asymmetric dependencies of the and of, of the economic systems of the social systems of the political systems of these places uh, we shouldn't write sexual violence out of the story simply because there are all of these methodological narrative and ethical questions around how do we write about this we need to take up those dilemmas and figure out a way to not silence this dimension of uh, the communities in question so with that Thank you very much. And I will open the floor to what I hope will be a good discussion. Thank you.